Hello Info person, this is Anton and today we're going to discuss some of the more recent and I guess somewhat unusual discoveries in regards to the beautiful object you see behind me, Ceres. Because today we're taking a deeper look at this celestial body that quietly surprised the scientists not just with its complexity but also with the potential for maybe having habitable conditions sometimes in the past. And that's despite the fact that this object is located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And though at some point it was considered to be an asteroid, today we refer to this as a dwarf planet. But based on some of the recent discoveries, including the incredible mission by NASA known as Dawn, we've actually ended up discovering some really incredible things about Ceres that we're going to be discussing today. But first, just a little bit of history, just so that you understand Ceres a little bit better. This was discovered back in 1801. Here, Giuseppe Piazzi, at the Palermo Astronomical Observatory in Sicily, announced the discovery of a new planet. And it was a new planet for over half a century. But as more and more unusual objects started to be discovered in the asteroid belt, eventually astronomers started to refer to them as star-like. This was how the term asteroid was coined. And so this became known as One Ceres, the first asteroid discovered. But this object was just a little bit too small to be seen with the naked eye and was a little bit too far to study, even with the most powerful telescopes. Here the overall size is approximately 940 kilometers across. But the real transformation in terms of understanding this object came in 2007. This was the launch of the Dawn mission that spent 13 months orbiting Vesta, before departing for Ceres and arriving there in 2015. And here the data collected by this mission, by using visual, infrared and even gamma ray observations, unveiled an incredible world we could not even imagine. And one of the most unexpected discoveries initially was the very high water content. Here the surface was a mixture of water ice and hydrated minerals like carbonates and clays, which was somewhat unexpected with additional data suggesting that there seems to be a lot of muddy, differentiated ice rock that seems to make up most of this object. And here by volume, at least 50% is water. And that's a remarkable figure compared to Earth where water represents only 0.1%. And though some studies have proposed the existence of some kind of an ocean, it has not been proven yet. Despite of this, researchers did discover evidence of enormous reservoir of brine or salty water that seems to be hidden beneath the surface. And it's this briny water that then led to another incredible discovery, cryovolcanism. Ceres seems to contain at least a few features, very likely formed by ancient cryovolcanoes, with some of them suggesting activity in the last few millions of years. And strangely enough, at least one object, this one right here known as Ahuna Mons, was potentially formed as a result of a collision on the opposite side of Ceres. And so here the Caravan Basin, that was definitely formed by a powerful collision, seems to have created this feature on the opposite side of Ceres when the fracturing inside crust triggered an eruption of very high viscosity cryomagma exploding from within. And so this was created by some kind of a muddy, salt-softened water ice. And here the surface overall seems to be very young, mostly because it doesn't actually contain that many craters compared to what we predict from similar objects. And this is extremely likely because there seems to be some kind of an unusual geological activity on the surface, which could be explained by cryovolcanoes. But they very likely don't happen very often. Right now the simulations suggest that maybe every 50 million years or so, there's at least one cryovolcano formed on the surface. But for now at least that's all theoretical. And on top of this, Ceres also contains these very bizarre bright objects known as faculae. There's actually quite a lot of them everywhere. And this was one of the more bizarre discoveries in 2015. And though initially this was a mystery, eventually once again this was connected to salty water deposits. Specifically this seems to be a type of a salt from various types of evaporated briny water, mostly containing magnesium sulfate hexahydrate and usually associated with ammonia-rich clays, something that we usually find on Earth. And so this might have been formed by some kind of an outgassing from within Ceres, where sublimating ice then form these very bright spots. But what's even stranger is that Ceres also kind of, sort of, contains a little bit of an atmosphere. And not surprisingly, it seems to be made out of water vapor. It's a very thin atmosphere, but because of constant sublimation and because of occasional cryovolcanic eruptions, water is released from within, forming what's known as an exosphere on the surface. But because generally this type of an atmosphere should be stripped by the solar radiation, something seems to be replenishing it at all times. But in the last few years, there's also been this other exciting discovery coming from the surface. 
organic molecules. Various compounds detected in the Ergnutet crater and at least 11 separate regions. And so here are some of the recent studies discovered remarkably rich carbon-based elements that seem to represent at least 20% by mass. And that's actually at least five times higher than what we usually find inside various asteroids. But all of this suggests in that series very likely formed in some kind of a cold environment where it was able to accrete a lot of carbon-rich materials in the presence of water. But also, of course, confirming that it seems to have a lot of organic chemistry going on inside. With additional studies also discovering ammonium salts, further supporting the origin in the outer solar system, where many of these ices and many of these salts are usually found. But when it comes to their true origin, there's still maybe a little bit of uncertainty. And actually, there are at least two separate propositions. One of them suggests what's known as endogenic origin. Basically, these organic molecules possibly formed inside Ceres and were then brought to the surface through cryovolcanism. And the main support for this proposition is the fact that normally some of the longer and more complex organic molecules, especially long-chain aliphatic organics, get destroyed by the solar radiation and the cosmic rays very quickly. Within about 10 million years, there should be nothing left. And so whatever we see on the surface must have formed within the last 10 million years from something. But because there is so much of it, a typical meteorite should not be able to deliver enough. And also because many of these compounds seem to be found very close to cryovolcanic activity sites, this possibly implies internal origins. Naturally, if confirmed, this would also confirm internal energy sources that can easily support organic chemistry and maybe even biological processes. We'll come back to this idea in a few minutes. But then there's this other proposition, mostly coming from researchers from the Max Planck Institute. And this is the idea known as exogenic origin. The organics that are found here must have come from somewhere else and very likely from some kind of an impact. And here the analysis that was mostly done through visual observations discovered that many sites with organic molecules are relatively rare and usually do not seem to contain actual cryovolcanic signatures. And so in that separate study, the discovery was that there was no direct evidence that any of this came from within. And because in their simulations asteroids from the outer belt frequently collided with Ceres and also did so at a relatively low speed, it would generally allow many of these organic compounds to deposit over time. Although in this case, both propositions kind of make sense, and so there's actually a very high chance that maybe it's a bit of both. Maybe some of these organics indeed came from within, but some of them came from various asteroids. And since ammonium-rich deposits have also been discovered on the surface, and many of these ammonium deposits could not have come from asteroids, here it definitely hints on some kind of an internal activity that eventually releases stuff onto the surface. As a matter of fact, at least one study analyzed the yellowish ammonium-rich material found in the Consus crater, revealing a direct connection to various salty brines that seem to exist inside Ceres. Essentially suggesting that Ceres seems to contain a lot of ammonium inside as well, and that initially Ceres seemed to contain a lot of intriguing organic building blocks that eventually form this beautiful object. And so all these bizarre discoveries, such as abundant water, cryovolcanism, organic compounds, and even methane, present Ceres as this very exciting object, especially when it comes to the search for extraterrestrial life. And while it's usually not actively discussed, with most focus being objects like Europa and Enceladus, because Ceres has the most water of anybody in the inner solar system, except for, I guess, our own planet, and because it seems to contain briny water pockets inside, right now there's a bit of a possibility that this object may contain tiny biospheres inside these tiny pockets of water. But it's really this new research that specifically focuses on whether Ceres could have had a long-standing source of actual energy required for early life. And the discovery here is super exciting. Because in this study, researchers find a lot of similarities between what we have on Earth near hydrothermal vents and what the internal structure of Ceres may have been like approximately 2 to 3 billion years ago. And specifically here, the thermal and chemical models suggest that Ceres mimicked what happened on early Earth anywhere from about 500 million to 2 billion years after its formation, or about 2.5 to 4 billion years ago, with the subsurface ocean likely containing a steady supply of relatively hot water, containing a lot of organic molecules, dissolved gases, and of course methane, coming from all sorts of rocky formations on the bottom. And the heat for this process very likely came from the decay of 
radioactive elements inside the tiny rocky interior of this dwarf planet. This was of course a very common process in the early solar system, and something extremely similar happened on Mars as well. And so this bizarre period, that the researchers refer to as core metamorphism, potentially introduced a lot of the equilibrium into the ocean, providing crucial chemical energy for anything that might exist in these conditions. So, for example, chemotrophs, various bacterial organisms that usually exist in the depths of the ocean, that normally survive just from this hot water containing a lot of minerals. And the overall calculations suggest that this could have potentially supported a significant biosphere, at least two and a half to four billion years ago. Intriguingly, this is exactly when life on Earth also basically started and evolved. However, the series we see today is much, much colder. There's a lot more ice, a lot less liquid water, and very likely insufficient heat coming from radioactive decay. And so most water very likely froze, and any remaining liquid just became this highly concentrated brine. And that's different from what we kind of see on Europa and Enceladus. Those two objects still contain present-day internal heating, which is mostly created by the gravitational push and pull from their gas giant partners, Jupiter and Saturn. And so when it comes to Ceres, its greatest potential for habitability was very likely in the ancient past. But this finding, of course, has quite a few implications. First of all, it suggests that many other icy moons, and of course dwarf planets, even objects like Pluto, may have had very, very similar conditions inside, and could have also experienced these habitable periods two to four billion years ago, implying that life in the solar system hypothetically could have formed and potentially existed in a lot of different locations, or uh, practically everywhere. With the biggest question now being, did it? If we actually go to Ceres and if we drill really deep inside, are we going to find signs of ancient life, or are we going to find some kind of a sterile object containing nothing? And that's actually a really important question to answer when it comes to extraterrestrial biology. If after decades and decades of search we discover nothing else in the solar system except for life on planet Earth, this might suggest that life is indeed super rare and requires some extraordinary conditions to form, which for some reason happen on Earth, but not anywhere else. However, if one day we go back to Ceres, or if we go to Enceladus and Europa and discover something inside, the implications here will be that life probably exists all over the place. Very likely many planets, lots of different moons, especially icy ones, and possibly even some other bizarre objects we have not even considered yet. And intriguingly, to try to answer this question, we just have to go back to Ceres and find a way to collect a sample. And this might potentially lead us to some important answers when it comes to the scientific debate about the origins of life and the life somewhere out there. And well, unfortunately right now there's really only one proposition, and this one is from the European Space Agency. This is known as the Calathes mission, proposed back in 2018, that would try to collect a sample from the Oxeter crater in order to answer some of these questions. Although as far as I know, this mission is not actively being planned, and we don't even know if it's going to ever happen. Alternatively, the Chinese National Space Administration is also allegedly planning to go to Ceres sometimes in 2020s. But we don't really know if it's going to happen either, and I haven't heard of any updates since 2020. Nevertheless, a mission to series would definitely be super exciting and very important, at least for science. Mostly because this object, despite being super cold, reminds us that even these extreme objects seem to hold deep, fascinating secrets, providing unique windows into the early solar system, but also providing hints on potential extraterrestrial life. And so once we learn something else about Ceres, and peel back some of these layers in regards to these bizarre distant worlds, we'll come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads, and can DM it directly, maybe support this channel by joining the channel membership that grants you early access, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.